Everybody knows what a labyrinth is, a puzzle on a page like this one. You have to navigate through it, maybe with a pencil, to get to the centre or back out again. Or it might even be a maze in the grounds of a house made from planting hedges, like this one. There are numerous famous ones, like this one at Hampton Court, a former royal palace just west of London. And here is the answer to the puzzle, how to get in and out. But a labyrinth doesn't need to have a geographical basis at all. It can be a trick in a book. Books have been used as entertainment in magic shows since the 15th century. Typically, a member of the audience is called on stage and invited to choose at random a word, a phrase or image from a book and keep their choice secret. The magician then, in a few steps, reveals precisely what the spectator has selected from the book. It's called a book test. According to Wikipedia, the earliest surviving example in print was found in a volume called Il Labyrinto, The Labyrinth, by the Venetian nobleman Andrea Ghisi. He originally published it in 1607. There's no known portrait of this man, but there are images from his book, like this. It must have been a sensation at the time, since it was translated into English only a few years later. The aim of such tricks is that the magician must appear to have the power of telepathy, even when he doesn't have. In the modern day, book tests of a more serious kind were developed to test for telepathy. The issue being addressed is, if spirits of the dead are claiming contact with the living through mediumship, what evidence is there that the medium is receiving genuine information from the dead and not simply retrieving it from the mind of the living person sitting with them using telepathy? What confuses the issue is when a medium offers facts claimed to be unknown to the sitter but later found to be accurate. What does that tell us about telepathy? These new book tests were intended to investigate whether or not the mediums are really in touch with the other side. Here's a 19th century photograph of an American chemistry professor, James Mapes. During his life, his focus was on inventions and scientific agriculture. But in the 1850s, with the psychic revelations of the Fox sisters at Hydesville, he became disturbed by this mediumistic interest, even among his own family and friends. He thought they must be, and I quote, running to mental seed and imbecility. Even worse, his daughter claimed to be an automatic writing medium. So he asked her for a demonstration. The message she provided appeared to come from his deceased father. Quote, you may recollect that I gave you, among other books, an encyclopedia, the message said. Look at page 120 of that book and you will find my name written there. Well, this encyclopedia had been stored unseen in a warehouse for 27 years and Mapes had not used it in all that time. When he retrieved it, as predicted, his father's name appeared, written on page 120. During the 1870s, the medium William Stainton Moses, an Anglican minister about whom I produced a separate video regarding his life and spirit teachings, he also discovered that his psychic skill included automatic writing. So he set out to test the spirits. In one of these tests, without checking beforehand which book he'd chosen, Stainton Moses asked the communicator to provide the last paragraph on page 94 of the last book on the second shelf. In response, his hand automatically wrote, I will curtly prove by a short historical narrative that popery is a novelty and has gradually arisen and grown up since the primitive and pure time of Christianity not only since the apostolic age, but ever since the lamentable union of church and state by Constantine. Moses went to the bookshelf and found these to be the exact words of the last paragraph, except that the word narrative had been substituted for account. So he continued with other similar tests that also proved satisfactory to him. 
Perhaps the most important investigator of such book tests was another English minister, the Reverend Charles Drayton Thomas, who died in 1953. This is his photograph. And this other photograph is of the medium with whom he undertook his tests, Gladys Osborne Leonard, who lived until 1968. A well-known and respected medium, she claimed to have experienced her first visitation from spirits as a child and said they would show her landscapes that she referred to as the Happy Valley. In February 1917, through Gladys Osborne Leonard, Charles Drayton's deceased father, Reverend John Thomas, identified himself and suggested book tests as a way of confirming his identity. He told his son to go into his library when he returned home and take the sixth book from the left on the lowest shelf. On page 149, three quarters of the way down, he would find a word that conveyed the meaning of falling back or stumbling. Drayton Thomas found this passage which read, To whom a crucified Messiah was an insuperable stumbling block. Charles's father claimed he was better able to get the appropriate sense of the passage rather than the actual words themselves, and said this business of book tests was as much a matter of experimentation on his side of the veil as it was for his son alive on earth. In some cases, he could sense the sound of words, he said, but not the actual spelling. Gladys Osborne Leonard never visited Drayton Thomas's home, so she knew nothing about his books or his library. Realising, however, that his subconscious might have recorded the details of the books that his father was referring to, Drayton Thomas decided to experiment using books in a friend's house about which he knew nothing. He informed his father of the plan who agreed to cooperate. In one test, his father said that on page two of the second book from the right on a particular shelf, there was a reference to sea or ocean, but he was not sure which, having sensed the idea and not the words. When Drayton Thomas visited the friend's house and found the appropriate place in the book, he read, A first-rate seaman, grown old between sky and ocean. And so the test continued. Over a couple of years, a total of 348 tests were carried out, and of these, 242 were counted as successful. 46 were regarded as uncertain, and 60 were seen as failures. The dead Thomas Senior explained the failures and an inability on his part to communicate an idea through the mind of the medium. You might be interested that Charles Drayton Thomas wrote up his findings from his experiments in this book, Some New Evidence for Human Survival, published in 1922. So what about the possibility of experimental fraud? These book tests have been reported on by different investigators at different times, and it's possible that in isolated cases fraud may have happened but it's unlikely as a complete explanation to cover the whole variety of tests. So what about exact matches by pure coincidence or simple wishful thinking? The possibility was addressed in the early 1920s in a series of sham book tests. 60 people were asked to choose 10 books from their shelves and to search for each of the three following ideas within them. Firstly, on the top quarter of page 60 in each book, a passage should be particularly relevant to your father. Secondly, on the bottom half of page 35 in each book, find an allusion to circles of some kind. Thirdly, in the top 10 lines of page 84 in each book, find a reference to frost and snow, or a passage conveying that idea. A total of 1,800 passages were examined, and the results were compared with genuine psychic book tests. The examiner was Eleanor Sidgwick, shown here. She was a mathematician and physicist, as well as the principal of Newnham College, Cambridge, and she was a leading figure in the Society for Psychical Research. The results showed that successors and partial successors in the sham tests totaled less than 5%. In contrast, three of the most successful so-called spirits 
working through Gladys Osborne Leonard, had successes of 38%, 47% and 68%. Eleanor Sidgwick wrote up her findings for the Proceedings of the Society for Psychical Research, Issue 31, in an article entitled An Examination of Book Tests Obtained in Sittings with Mrs. Leonard. And in these proceedings, she also wrote in 1923 an article entitled On the Element of Chance in Book Tests. So now the story continues, not book tests this time, but newspaper tests, where the newspaper has yet to be printed for the following day. Again, it was Charles Drayton Thomas who carried out these newspaper tests with his father through the services of Mrs. Leonard. Apparently, the results were achieved by a combination of precognition and clairvoyance. On January the 16th, 1920, for example, Drayton Thomas was told to examine the Daily Telegraph for the following day, January the 17th, in which he would observe the name of his birthplace, Victoria Terrace in Taunton, printed near the top of the second column of the first page. When he checked this issue, he found the word Victoria in exactly the right place. Almost four weeks later, he was told that in the times of the following day, near the top of column two on the first page, he would find the name of a minister with whom his father had been friendly when the family lived in the town of Leek in Staffordshire. He recognised no appropriate names, but his mother called his attention to the name Perks, telling him that Reverend George Perks had been his father's friend and used to visit them when they lived in Leek. Thomas was also told that two-thirds of the way down column one in this paper, he would find a word suggesting ammunition, also the name of a former teacher, and next to it a French place name looking like three words hyphenated into one. He found the word canon referring to a rank in the Church of England, although it's phonetically identical to the gun known as a canon. The Belgian town of brain le chateau was also in the column indicated, and the name of his former teacher, Watts, sat next to it in the adjacent column. After contacting the newspaper, Drayton Thomas discovered that this page he had been inspecting had not even been typeset at the time that his father provided these details. Many other newspaper tests were carried out by Drayton Thomas, and not all of them used the Times or the Daily Telegraph. In each case, he immediately wrote down the information which had to be found and sealed it into an envelope and mailed it to the Society for Psychical Research before the type had been set at the newspaper office. He also checked the newspapers from at least 10 other days to confirm that the same names did not appear by coincidence in those editions. Some of the tests were inconclusive and a few were failures, but the positive results were by far in the majority. So how does this process work, so-called spirits being able to see things not yet in print? The deceased Thomas Senior admitted that he didn't know. He suggested that maybe the things he saw were the spiritual counterparts of things about to take form, a bit like a kind of shadow. With a shadow you see an outline but you don't see the detail, as with these tests. We cannot always observe the detail, he said. On another occasion, Thomas Senior pointed out that although the words may not yet be in type, someone's thought might already have formulated the writing. However, he agreed that for the most part, the process is beyond human or his own comprehension. If you're interested in this topic of book tests, you might like some further reading in addition to the titles I've already mentioned for Drayton Thomas and Dr. Eleanor Sidgwick. Arthur Conan Doyle wrote about it in The History of Spiritualism, available on Amazon, and you might also find it in a free PDF copy. Pamela Glenn Connor refers to it in The Earthen Vessel in her book of 1921. And William Stainton Moses covers his experience of these in his book, Spirit Teachings. I'd like to thank Mike Tim for his expertise in enabling me to outline this topic. 
You might like his article to be found in the Society of Psychical Research Sci- Encyclopedia, which is online. It's a shame more people are not interested in this evidential material. Thanks for listening.